Today we will go to the book of Genesis chapter 35 from verse 16 to verse 29 and the topic is a time for sorrow. The book of Genesis chapter 35 from verse 16 to verse 29. Then they moved on from Bethel while they were still some distance from Ifra. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephra, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Medar Adler. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhar, and Israel heard of it. Jacob had twelve sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Sibylon. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's servant Bilhar, Dan, and Naphtali, uh, the sons of Leah's servant Silpah, God, and Asher. These were son, the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Palam Aram. Jacob came home to his father Isaac in memory near Kirath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived a hundred and eighty years, then he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people old and full of years, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Everything has its time, and as the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 from verse 1 and 2 said, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot. I believe this is almost an exact summary for us to conclude this last part of chapter 35 in the book of Genesis. Meanwhile, it is also the last part of Jacob being the main focus in the book of Genesis, and it is laying out some background details for the audience to remember before we head to the next character which is Joseph's story. As beautiful as it start out in the beginning of chapter 35, where we saw Jacob and all his sons repented of their own sins and followed God's direction in their lives, and God reaffirmed Jacob of his divine blessings in his life. But then we quickly come to see that sorrow follow. It said, then they moved on from Bethel, while they were still some distance from Ephra. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. So this is probably one of the worst days in Jacob's life so far. The love of his life is dying on her deathbed, giving birth to their son. One can only imagine the pain and the helplessness that Jacob got to witness the passing of his love while he can do nothing beside her. As much as we are hopeful in the promises of God, we still cannot escape the fact that we are not immortal on earth. Death will eventually knock on our door, and it does not matter how much we have, or which famous person we know, or how much fame we have, or how much we have planned in our lives and not yet finished, death will come to us all in one day. Sometimes we mourn for the life that was claimed by death too soon. Sometimes we mourn for the life that was not even born yet. But in any situation, 
Death is part of our life cycle in this sinful world, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. So first point being made here, whether you are Christians or not, cherish the people and the things you have in your life today. I know that you may heard this phrase or this saying a lot of times in your life, but I mean, really let this, let this saying sink into your mind and your heart. That is, cherish the people and the things you have in your life today. I know it is easy to get to your mind. You know, you probably remember it or whenever someone starts the sentence, you will already know what is going to come next. But then it's easy to get this singing in your mind. But to your heart, that is the difficult part. Because when we are healthy, we feel like we are the immortal and nothing we cannot overcome. So we set our plans and goals in our lives, but you know, not necessarily in a good priority. Not necessarily setting our priority right in the midst of chasing this goal and pursuing that fame or other plans that we have planned out in our lives. So the main question is, do you have the correct priority in your life right now? Do you set God as the first priority, family second, and then work, and then so on and so forth? If not, you really need to let this sink into your heart, not just your mind, once again, into your heart right now. Because things can get out of control when the time we set our plans and goals and then kind of justify the reason why I need to chase all the money or chase all the fame because I need to put food on the table for my family, but forgot that the priority, it actually matters. So cherish the people and the things you have today. Enjoy the part of your hard work with the people who loves and cares for you. Say kind and loving words to the people around you, even if those are the people that you may not know because, well, this is the thing that we lack of today. That is kind and loving words. That is kind and loving cares to the people around you. We have enough simple events and thoughts in our world already. So we need to understand how important it is for us to actually send the message of kind and love to this world. And above all, above all, what we need to do today and right now is to acknowledge the love of God that He had given us. And this leads to the, to the second part of the same point, that is, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? This question goes to Christian as well. Don't think that I'm only addressing the people who do not yet believe in Jesus Christ. This question, same question, goes to Christians as well. Do you believe in Jesus Christ in both your heart and your mind? Do you accept Jesus Christ as your savior? Because there will be nothing other than Jesus who can stay with you through good and bad times of your life, and that include death one day. Jesus will be the only one who can take you away from sin and death. But the real question remained, do you know Jesus by your heart and your mind? Sometimes I found that some Christians only claim that they believe in God but there is no fruit in their lives that indicated the new life Jesus promised unto them. Other times I found Christians only emotionally attached to God, but their mind is everywhere. In translation, they love the idea and the lifestyle of following God, but they were never interested in reading the Word of God. They were never committed their lives to the biblical principle of God. And that leads to a fatal weakness in their faith. As Jesus put it in the parable of the seed, they are growing 
on the shallow soil. They sprung up quickly, but when the sun comes out and the heat strikes, they die because they have no root. So in either of the cases, they turn away from God when difficulties hit their lives. Instead of strengthening their faith in the Word of God, their faith withers because, simply because, they never commit themselves unto the Word of God. Jesus claimed that you need to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Notice that Jesus did not say part of your heart or just your heart but not your mind or vice versa. Jesus claimed with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. It did not give you any ambiguity to linger around thinking that I can only give this portion to God but not the others. So do you have the faith and confidence in Jesus that when you face the inevitable, you have the eternal life from God and not, no need to face the eternal death when the time comes. The last part of the same point is that sorrow will come into our lives uninvited. You know, funny thing is that I never heard any people in the entire world that they would actually invite sorrow into their lives, but then it always come uninvited. This part, this part of the scripture in chapter 34 already imply this, but I'm stressing this point only until now because this is actually where it hits Jacob the hardest. As much as we have God on our side, it never stops sorrow from going into our lives. Look at this chapter again. Jacob and his son repented. God reaffirmed Jacob's blessing right before all this sorrow event happened in his life. So once again, as much as we have God on our side, it will never stop sorrow from going into our lives. This may not be a common topic we talked about on our daily basis or heard from any sermon, but it is an important subject to address. No matter how much we follow God with everything we got, even if you committed yourself with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, you know, it will not stop sorrow from coming into our lives. We can escape it. We can avoid it. It just happens. Most times when sorrow hits, we tend to look for the reason why it happens and eventually turn our focus from sorrow to chasing who and what I can blame for all these bad things to happen. So instead of facing the sorrow with the God who loves us dearly and promised to stay with us no matter what, we turn to our sinful nature and went on to find out who I can blame or what events that I can blame so that I don't need to face my sorrow. This path, this blaming thing or this blame game will lead us to dwell in the sorrow and not be able to come back out. As we look back to Genesis chapter 3, as Adam and Eve already demonstrated for us that this blame game will only lead us to dwell in regret and sorrow without any solution provided. I once heard a charismatic sermon on why Rachel died, and it was because she proclaimed it a few chapters back, give me son, or I will die. So she, she self-proclaimed her own death and she got only herself to blame for this. After I heard that part of the sermon, I was completely shocked because it got the audience to nowhere. First off, 
If Rachel did not say that, would she live forever? Second of all, it strikes an irrational fear in all of the audience that we better mark down every single word we say every single day, because we do not know what will come true and what will not. And if I say something bad, will it eventually happen? Will it become a curse that follow us around? That is absolutely ridiculous. But then, more importantly, is that this blame game really getting us to nowhere close to God. So it's not who is responsible for the sorrow that we should focus on, and sorrow definitely is not the place we want to dwell in. Our focus should be on the one who actually saved us, and that is Jesus Christ, who stays with me. When sorrow comes uninvited, and Jesus is the one who knows and understands us, and He is the one who is able to comfort us in our lives. Hebrews chapter two verse eighteen said, "Because He Himself suffered when He was tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted." In the same book, chapter four, verse fifteen to sixteen. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The way to face sorrow is not to shift to. Who and what I can blame, but to know that Jesus can turn any curses and bad things into a blessings into in our lives, and we can turn to Him for comfort, grace, and mercy and blessings. It may not sound like something we want to do during our time of sorrow, but Jacob certainly did that for Benjamin. Rachel wanted to name. His her son Ben Oni, meaning son of my trouble, but Jacob changed his name to Benjamin, meaning son of my right hand. This is a great act on Jacob's part. If Rachel's son was really named Ben Oni, it will be the sorrow for the rest of both Jacob and Benjamin's life to dwell in, and it will get them nowhere in life. Every time Jacob turned to his son, if his son was named Ben Oni, it will only remind the both of them what happened when her, when Ben Oni was born. God certainly does not wish we dwell in our sorrow for too long, and Jacob did that for Benjamin, naming him the son of my right hand, to shift from sorrow to a hopeful future. Requires our faith in God, because God is the only one who can bless us all and turn our sorrow into joy. So, do you see how important it is to have Jesus as the Son of God in our lives today? So, if you do not already know Him, I urge that you should, you should know Jesus in your life. As the Son of God, as your personal Savior. But well, as we moved on to the next two verses, sorrow took another huge step into Jacob's life. It said, Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Medar Adler. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine Bilhar, and Israel. Heard of it? We have a saying, right? When it rains, it pours. But that's not even enough to describe what happened to Jacob at this point. His firstborn son, Reuben, went in and slept with his concubine Bilhar after the passing of Rachel. Don't forget, Bilhar was Rachel's maid servant. This verse always upset me a lot, and I'm not even sure 
if the word upset is the correct description of how I feel inside when I read this verse. But then, any way possible, let me stick with the word upset. Okay, it this this description in this verse really really upset me a ton because. It is something that should not be happening in any way possible. But then the Bible recorded clearly about what Reuben had done in his father's family. And this is also one of the consequences from chapter thirty-four, where Jacob gave up his father authority in his family as well. To look at the act itself. From、uh, Reuben, it was the firstborn son attempt to claim the fatherly figure in the household by sleeping with his father's concubine. Another example of the same thing is that if you look at David's son Absalom, did the same thing in public to claim over the throne from David, and this evil act. Inevitably brought his own destruction upon himself, and Reuben's action here was no different. A scholar suggested that Reuben was preventing Bilhar to succeed as Jacob's favorite wife after the passing of Rachel, and at the same time, Reuben was expressing the resentment that Leah was not honored by Jacob. But in my own opinion. On this is that on top of all the scholar's suggestion, Jacob's fatherly figure was destroyed in his children's mind when Dinah incident happened in chapter thirty-four, so that Reuben would have the mean to carry out such evil to his own father, and it always scares me that the consequences of Jacob's mistake can lead to such evil things to happen in his life. Now note that I am not justifying Reuben's evil act here. Well, the Bible did not as well, and I'm also not placing the blame on Jacob bringing this evil on his own. I'm merely stressing the point where we need to be cautious about our own decisions. Sometimes our inaction may may cause more harm than any actions we might have thought of. I know decision making in itself is already very difficult, but we need to take some time to evaluate what basis do I have when I make my own decision. Is my decision based on what I like? Is it based on what I think, or is it based on the biblical principle? In the book of Song, chapter one hundred nineteen, verse one hundred five. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. At the same time, in the book of Proverbs, chapter fourteen, verse twelve, said, "There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death." These two verses made a sharp contrast and easy to understand, but at the same time, it is very difficult to apply. And why is it difficult to apply? Because we used to follow our own way of thinking, and not on what God says is good or not. And more importantly, most of us did not finish reading the Bible, if at all. And so, when the time comes to make our decision, we literally have no basis of what the Bible says whether it's good or not. So it was never a chance. For the word of God to manifest in our lives, good and long enough to even make any decision on the biblical principles. How sad is this, right? We have the eternal truth in front of us, but never allow the eternal truth to enter our lives. We claim that Jesus loves us and saves us, but we have no basis of this truth rooted in our lives. It's like me saying I love my wife all the time, but I kept my distance from my wife all the time as well. So how true is that love? 
how true is the word that coming out from my mouth saying I love my wife? It does not make any sense. On this same point about Reuben, we will always need to keep this in mind. That is, we should never do evil unto evil. Two wrongs do not make one right. It only makes two wrongs. From Reuben's perspective, since his own father did not honor his own fatherly responsible responsibility to his sister, and he did not seem to care to be their father at all. So why should he continue to feel Jacob as his own father as Jacob already gave it up? So now seems to be the right time for Reuben to take over the head of household away from his father to protect his own brothers and sisters. But this imagination argument probably is Reuben's self-righteousness speaking. And it is nowhere close to the righteousness of God at all. I believe I preached on this point before, but I have to emphasize this again, especially in our time and our age. We see a lot of bad things, even evil things happening in the world every single day. Christians or not, we long to see justice when bad things happen. But to be clear here, I never object the idea of seeking justice because it is part of us being created according to God's own images. So when injustice happened, we seek justice. It is normal. However, when justice doesn't seem to happen, it frustrated people as to why God would be silent and allow the evil to continue manifest itself in this world as if God does not care if at all. Eventually, people may take it into their own hands thinking that we are the right hand of God to carry out justice because it's way overdue. So we do things according to what we think is good and gradually we self-justify our own actions and misuse the name of God to carry out what seems to be justice in our own eyes. All these logical thinking are normal in our sinful world, and we witness it every single day. But what I need to emphasize here is that as much as these self-righteous talk sounds right to yourself, it never aligned with the righteousness of God. If it were true, if these thoughts were from the righteousness of God, God would not even consider sending his own son Jesus Christ to redeem us in the first place. He would just have to kill Adam and Eve and send them to hell and get it done with. Well, thank God it did not happen because God did not do that. God sent Jesus to die for all sinners on the cross. Why? He died for us for our own sins. And for us to take away is that even if it is difficult to accept, it is still the best way to reveal the righteousness of God is not to bring judgment upon sinners, but to reveal the righteousness of God on the cross of Jesus Christ. So let me say again, this truth right here is difficult to accept, but then the best way to reveal the righteousness of God is not to bring judgment upon sinners, but to reveal the righteousness of God on the cross of Jesus Christ. And know one important thing as the responsibility of being a Christian. That is, we are here to preach his gospel. We are here to reconcile sinners with God and not to bring his judgment upon people. Is it easy to withstand injustice in our lives? No. Is it right? To withstand injustice in our lives? No. 
but we should seek justice in and righteousness in our lives. But the main thing is that, do we get carried away by our own emotions and allow evil thoughts to take a stand in our mind, end up seeking our own version of justice and righteousness instead of God's version of justice and righteousness. In my own experience, after preaching this point, most Christians would say, it is too difficult to do that, or it is impossible to do it even if we intend to do it. Well, Jesus said, pick up your cross to follow me. Did we not remember this? If we do not pick up our own cross, we are unworthy to follow Jesus. Also remember one thing, we already died on the cross and today we live the new life with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's not because it is difficult so that we do not do it. It is because we do not want to acknowledge the fact that we need to live our new lives based on biblical principle and that we are still fighting against God for the Lordship in our own lives and that include our emotions as well. As you can see in these two verses, Israel did not say anything or take any action against Reuben, but his consequences came later in his life. When Israel was supposed to bless him with his firstborn blessing, well, Reuben only to receive a curse from his own father. So remember this, whip what you sow. If you follow God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind, you will whip the righteousness of God. If you follow yourself, if you justify yourself, if you self-proclaim that you are righteous, you will whip your own consequences of your own actions. And once again, two wrongs doesn't make one right. And we continue to see from verse 23 to verse 24, it is an elaborated list of Jacob's son. But what's special here is that this list actually lay out which wife of Jacob gave birth to which son. At the first glance of it, it may not imply much. You may discard it as it is just, you know, some recording of Jacob's son L or this is just a conclusion unto Jacob's chapter by listing all the sons that he had. However, it may imply a little bit more than just all that. To list out his sons according to which wife gave birth to actually gave us the background unto Joseph's story in the chapters to come. It reminds us that what the dynamic is intention in Jacob's family. As Rachel died in this chapter, Jacob's affection for Rachel may very well shift to Joseph and Benjamin only. And so it gives us the understanding why Jacob would value Joseph the most in the whole family. And for Reuben to commit such a disgusting sin against his own father also suggested that the fact that his sons may continue to cross the line and do evil according to their own desire, in which you would now be able to connect the dots that why his sons would sell Joseph to Egypt and lie to Jacob about the fake death of Joseph. But before I continue to say what happened in the coming chapters that is related to this simple family tree in these two verses, let's move on and focus on the last three verses of this chapter. Because one last sorrow hit Jacob's life. Verse 27 said, Jacob came home to his father Isaac in memory near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, 
where Abraham and Isaac had stayed, Isaac lived a hundred and eighty years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. The last sorrow in this part of the chapter Jacob needed to endure is that his father also passed away. However, it may be a bittersweet event because the Bible indicated that Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people old and full of years. It is a blessing for anyone to die of old age and full of years in the Bible because it implied that the person lived fully to the grace of God in his or her own life. So the passing of Isaac may not carry the same sorrow, the same weight as Rachel's death brought. At the same time, Esau and Jacob buried Isaac together, which is also a meaningful description in this event. The family broke apart because Jacob, Jacob cheated Esau and Isaac, and he ran away for his life for a really long time. But the two brothers were able to reconcile under the grace of God. This is truly something beautiful to happen in any family. But with all the good things I can point out in here, it will not lighten the sad fact that parents will pass away one day. And it does not matter how old we were when it happened, death still brings sorrow. In our lives. But since death is inevitable, the last question I'll leave you in this sermon to reflect on is a quotation from a movie Every man dies, but not every man lives. So, how do we live today? What do we live for today? Are we living in the Word of God and in His grace? Or we still live a life that does not reflect Christ at all? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived their lives in the promises of God, and still today we are studying how they follow God in their faith. So do you want to live your life full of God's promises and blessings? In the midst of sorrowful events happen in life, you would still have the faith and courage in God to reflect Christ. And that will be your decision to make now. So with all this sorrow happened in this last part of chapter 35, I hope that you know that God is always there for Jacob and God is always here for you as well. And I hope that instead of dwelling in the sorrowful event that may be happening to you right now or that may have happened before in the past god has the healing for you he is waiting for you to open yourself up for him to enter into your life and bring healing in your life today so will you will you make the decision to allow Jesus to enter into your life and change all that sorrowful events, all those sorrow, and turn them into joy for you. And I sincerely hope and pray that you would make the right decision to invite Jesus into your life. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we sin against you. And we know that sorrow will come uninvited into our lives and bring us sadness and perhaps drag us into the sorrow long enough that we may not see any hope anymore. Sorrow also prevents us from getting healed in which you already reserved healing for us. So Father, I pray that you will help us to make the correct decision to let the sorrow go into you and in exchange you bring us healing 
you bring us peace, you bring us joy, and once again be able to live fully in your grace. Father, we know that Jacob's example or Jacob's life reflect how our lives are today. But then, Father, I pray that you will once again reveal unto us how you are going to bless our lives according to your love and according to your grace and mercy. And so, Father, strengthen us with the Holy Spirit and may the Holy Spirit help us to let go of the sorrow and allow you to be the God of our lives. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.